Thank you, Hester. Um, and thank you to Laura for inviting me um, to speak as part of this uh, day as well as for participating in the master classes. Um, I do feel very much that I am punching above my weight in this company. Um, it is a, a real honour to speak alongside people whose work um, admired for so long. So, the experience of doing a job can frame understandings of the self in the world. It can also be profoundly emotional. To ask another person, how was your day, is to request not only a list of events or completed tasks, but an embodied sense of mood or feeling. Anger, irritation, boredom, joy, anxiety, jealousy, fury, even love can all play a part in the story of that day. And for most of our adult lives, that day is a working day, whether our labour is paid or unpaid. The spaces, things, people and processes we encounter in work are steeped in feeling and respond to it. Feelings at work can be just as intense, challenging and formative as those associated with our intimate lives. And this has, of course, long been the case. This paper comes out of a book project that brings labour history, the history of emotion and histories of subjectivity together, using a mixture of life writing, oral history and popular culture. It examines how and why feelings at work have changed since 1945, focusing largely on paid employment, whilst acknowledging that the category work does not only encompass employment for pay. And the broader project is organised around six themes, feelings about work, feelings as work, the management of feeling in the workplace, love, sex and harassment at work, the shifting status of the emotional worker and the intersections between working selves and other selves. The research spins around the term feeling rather than emotion or affect. This is partly to foreground, as others have also chosen to do, the entanglement of sensation and cognition. But feeling also reflects and speaks to the historically situated language of everyday life for the period I am studying, or at least the language of my primary source base. The aim is to think alongside the everyday theorising of so-called ordinary people and to think with vernacular expressions and conceptualisations as others in today's audience, um, particularly Florence Braithwaite uh, Sutcliffe um, and Natalie Tomlinson have done. Repurposing Sarah Ahmed's question, what do emotions do? I'm also interested in the work that people did with what they believed to be feeling. And this is, is quite messy work, of course, um, but I quite like the messiness of it. I mean, I'm using feeling, but I should say following um, what Thomas said in his talk, um, there's a sort of process of kind of setting the net wide, using feeling as a way of, of, of an openness, methodologically, but then that fear, worry about collapsing everything into feeling. So opening the category up and then perhaps taking the bits out and seeing what we capture with that category. In what I'm going to say this afternoon, I'm going to focus largely upon feelings about work and feelings at work rather than feelings as work, sexual harassment, emotional workers or the impact of work on feeling. Um, I've argued elsewhere that the post-war workplace um, saw women, single as well as married women, performing increasing amounts of unpaid emotional labour. Um, so I'm not going to say much about that today, although um, unpaid emotional labour um, really does um, set 
the context for why I started thinking about this particular project, um, the particular conditions of work for women in academia today. But the history of feelings at work extends beyond the performance of emotional labour to include the bodies, relationships, styles, spatial dynamics, objects, being mindful of Rodri's talk, and codes through which emotion is in Monique Shear's formulation a kind of practice. The workplaces described by post-war narrators were complex and challenging sites for the performance and management of individual and collective feeling. Moreover, feelings at work extended beyond the physical workplace. Just as the emotional practices of private life bled into the working day. In this way, a distinction between public and private emotional domains is not analytically helpful. Even if the movement between constructions of these domains demanded distinct emotional styles. So I'm going to now talk about feelings about work and then I'm going to move on to talk about feelings at work. Um, so, and I'm going to use um, the archive mass observation as the lens through which to look at this today. In the autumn of 1947, a time of economic crisis and domestic reconstruction, mass observation distributed its regular questionnaire or directive, as it called them, to its panel of ordinary volunteer writers. In keeping with the practice developed during the Second World War, it posed a number of seemingly unrelated questions. Describe in as much detail as you can the material ways in which you think that the present crisis is going to affect you personally. And what sort of things are you most afraid of, reasonably or unreasonably? And have you ever, when believing yourself to be completely awake, had a vivid impression of seeing or being touched by a living being or inanimate object or of hearing a voice? But the panellists were also asked, how do you feel about your job at present? The historicity of feeling is striking in the mass observation responses. Demobilisation, nationalisation, a concerted export drive and a shortage of goods provided a distinctive context for the everyday experience of work in 1947. A wartime emphasis upon duty, sacrifice and utility persisted and informed the narration of their feelings. The validation of service rather than the pursuit of self-fulfilment characterises most of the replies alongside a, alongside a concern about the social value of their own employment. An ex-soldier recorded his own frustration that, quote, at present I work in an art gallery and I'm completely dissatisfied with my work as it does little except pamper the idle rich and achieves nothing. No offence to anybody who works in art galleries. Um, elsewhere, we find railway workers anxious about the imminent nationalisation of the train companies. We read of the hopes and fears of those whose jobs came under the auspices of the National Health Service Act as they pondered the implications of major organisational change. We encounter the emotional difficulties of moving from military service to civilian life and the irritations of housewives in the face of continued rationing. We also see frequent links drawn between feelings about work and job security. The writing provides an insight into the lived experience of macroeconomic priorities as well as into gendered and classed definitions of work and notions of what really <coughs> constituted a job. <coughs> 
the responses are also replete in the more apparently mundane emotional texture of everyday working life. Feelings of anxiety, fear, boredom, frustration, regret, even hatred were expressed alongside those of happiness, satisfaction, pride, sometimes a real affection. As a solicitor put it, I love my work. I could not exist without it. Some found it difficult to pin down negative feelings, particularly if they believed their material conditions of work to be good. Others used the writing process to work out what they felt their feelings really were. A tax officer started his answer by admitting that, at present I'm feeling very much against my job and it seems very difficult to sort out all the reasons for feeling that way. But he ended by concluding that I was not born or bred to be a capitalist or a capitalist stooge. At present, my chief delight is to find ways to help the small man avoid paying. <laughs> <laughs> others, others evaded the question for reasons of self-preservation. One said, I feel that it is better not to feel about work, or for reasons of taste. My true feelings about my present job are unprintable, said one. Or they believed themselves to simply have no feelings about their job. Once out of the factory, I forget all about it. And if I, as if I was asked what job I was on at the time, I would have to give the answer quite a bit of thought, said one. But this man was an exception amongst these particular correspondents. In articulating their feelings, most mass observers wrote work into the fabric of everyday life and into their senses of self. A 48-year-old timber merchant offered a particularly detailed account, and I want to take you through this uh, as a whole. Um, he said, my feelings about my job are rather mixed ones, partly due to the mood of my managing director, partly due to my wife's feelings and partly due to my own, not always very even temper. I think my director is setting the pace in the first place and is he changeable? The whole company knows it and dread it, all love him dearly when he is away. <laughs> Number two at home, I took a clerk's job and now I am required at times to do some travelling. My wife hates it, I don't exactly love it, but I don't want to quit the job before having something at least as good in hand. So there is trouble at home and I cannot get tough with my wife because after all we came as refugees and my sons and I are all she has got. I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to quit the job. And I get it in the neck from both sides. Number three, the secretary of the company is a personal friend of mine who got me the job. Now my director says he knows I am worth much more, but he can't pay me because he cannot hurt the secretary and his seniority. <laughs> a pretty dance, don't you think? Still, I suppose it could be worse. <laughs> Um, a year later, Mass Observation again asks its panel about feelings about their jobs. Um, and when our timber merchant um, writes again a year later, issues two and three have been resolved for him. Um, he's now travelling less for work because he's actually replaced his friend as company <laughs> secretary. Uh, but he is still, however, having problems with, quote, the personality and temperament of the managing director who is the sort of chap who wants to do everything himself, the per friction, therefore being felt by everybody in the business. And the reason I, I like this account, I think it's a particularly striking account of the operation of male feeling in and around the workplace. Uh, the use of the archaic word per friction, a chilling through, conjures up an acutely physiological experience and emotional environment, generating shared feeling 
in a particular space. His writing shows us how he managed feeling um, in the workplace, but also in the transition between work and home. It tells us about the interactions of colleagues. It tells us about the context of his overall life story and his marital relationship and history. Um, and it also places it in his composed life story. So I think in this way, um, I'm finding that by looking at feelings at work, I'm finding a lot more beyond day-to-day -day interactions in the workplace. Um, that enables me to think about the significance of work, not just within individual lives, within collective lives, but within relationships, um, domestically and also elsewhere. So it's feelings about work, um, although there's a bit of feelings at work there too. Um, I want to say now something about feelings at work more explicitly. Amongst the mass observers writing in 1947, the emotional culture or atmosphere, or even perhaps landscape, um, of the workplace mattered. Thinking with Ben Highmore's recent work on moods and cultural feelings can help here. For Highmore, moods are material, historical and social, and they are also actively produced through labour. My interest is in the specific mechanisms through which a workplace mood was generated. Such as relationship management, spatial organisation, out of hours socialising and paying conditions. Essentially, I want to place the emotional and the material in the same interpretive frame. Often it was colleagues who wielded the greatest day-to-day -day influence upon everyday feeling, as a draftsman at the Ministry of Transport explained. My present job I frankly hate, without, however, adequate, reasonable reason for doing so. My wife and I have often disagreed about this. I saying I dislike my job, she saying she failed to see any adequate reason for my doing so. First, work is slack just now and getting slacker. I should probably get the sack soon. The hours drag intolerably. I have difficulty in keeping awake. Secondly, I do not like the atmosphere of the office. I am an intensely shy man, a poor mixer, an intellectual, or so I flatter myself, and I'm used to working on my own. The others are all breezy extroverts whose chief interest is the football pools, or appears to be. Only one has any pretense to intellectuality, and he, being a boss, is less approachable than the rest. Most are rather given to smutty jokes, one of them very much so. And the presence of two young girls does not stop him. I find it very distasteful. For this man, feelings of boredom and insecurity were compounded by a workplace culture from which he felt alienated. The epistemological status of his feelings, or rather their relationship to material conditions, had clearly been the subject of much domestic discussion. In contrast, a 19-year-old cartographer wrote that I like the people I work with. They create a happy, good-humoured atmosphere, which means a lot to me. She added, Also, the firm is very generous and sympathetic in cases of sickness and private affairs which interfere with working hours. My pay is good, with better prospects. But chiefly, it is the atmosphere that pleases me. So pay and conditions are not unimportant here, but the atmosphere contributes to our overall sense of well-being. Amongst these predominantly, though not in entirely middle-class panellists, the like-mindedness of colleagues had significant traction, speaking to the sociality of emotion, of feeling at home, at work. A newspaper man who declared himself happy in his work found his colleagues to be politically agreeable. The atmosphere, as I say, is informed and independent-minded. Other accounts were not so positive. A 43-year-old woman 
wished for more time and energy to devote to my main job, teaching, and not having so much wasted on fruitless discussion, listening to grouses and problems, being a sponge to soak up other people's problems, and organising for things that never happen. And she didn't even work in a university. <laughs> Now this statement is less about the performance of emotional labour and more about the debilitating effect of other people's feelings at work. But it was not just colleagues that were a factor. A distinct work atmosphere was generated out of particular spatial dynamics and material conditions. As a happy clerk put it, I work in a good, warm, well-lit office in the country and my colleagues are my friends. Friendship was not on the whole a frame for employee-employer relationships. A local government officer described his immediate supervisor as a vinegary old bitch <laughs> and, and the medical officer of health as the one person in the world I hate. The management of married men's feelings about their bosses was widely seen to be part of a woman's wifely work. As Carl Jung explained in the Daily Mail, women are unable to realise that in business their husbands are not the monarchs of all they survey. As often as not, they are underdogs who have had to put up with a great deal. A bullying boss, for instance, and the best remedy for that is a woman's understanding. And I was struck in Rodri's talk about the scientist and, and his wife and her emotional work at the end of the day. Within the 1947 material, women were much less likely to articulate complaints about their bosses than were men. Retrospective accounts are more forthcoming. Writing in 1997, one former secretary described sexual harassment as an everyday feature of the post-war office. And certainly magazine pages of the period regularly feature letters about lecherous bosses. The man I work for tries to hold my hands on every possible occasion and is always brushing against me or touching my dress, wrote Deirdre to Woman's World in 1953. He keeps trying to date me, but I just don't like him. Everyone pulls my leg about it, but I just hate having to take his letters. I tried snubbing him, but it seems to make him worse. What can I do? The magazine's response was unhelpful on so many levels. <laughs> If this man's attention is playing on your nerves, Deirdre, get transferred to another department. So to conclude briefly, ooh, oh yeah, not that one yet. Um, in this paper, I suggested that we might usefully approach the texture of working life like we approach the texture of personal life and that we can do this by exploring personal accounts of what work meant in a particular historical moment in particular sectors and four particular categories of worker. I've also, and I'm also trying, to think about the relationship between material conditions, individual feeling and collective mood. But I also want to address issues of scale, causation and interpretation because I too share some of the anxieties or at least some questions that Tim raised this morning. I want to use subjective experience and emotional practices to think about the economic changes of the last 70 years. To consider the ways in which work has been shaped by feeling, as well as the ways in which feeling has bent to the discipline of work. Essentially, I want to use this project to weigh the causal value of emotion for historians today, but also to explore the causal weight that people in the past believed feeling to have. But there have been significant shifts in the way individuals have felt about work since 1945. Um, and I'm also interested in mapping changing emotional cultures and identifying broader structures of feeling rooted in historical moments. But in the face of considerable change, there's also notable continuity of feeling and that continuity is rooted in classed and gendered notions of entitlement and perceptions of what doing a job for money might mean. So I want to end with an answer from a university lecturer to the question, how do you feel about your job 
1947, which I think demonstrates that continuity quite nicely. Just at the moment, I'm fed up with it because it prevents me from devoting all my time to some research projects in which I am particularly interested. I get too much routine administrative work to do. This is the basis nowadays of most senior members of university staffs, committees, supervision of thesis for other people, testimonials, advice to students and would-be students, college affairs and so on. All necessary and all a damn nuisance. I'm looking forward to a time when I can retire and I can settle down and think for a bit. <laughs> Thank you.